Welcome to our shir for this evening, which will focus on Parashat Yitro. Uh, now, of course, Parashat Yitro, uh, or Parsha Yisro, depending on how we look at it, um, its, its most prominent characteristic is the Aseret Dibro, the Ten Commandments. Um, but tonight we're not going to focus on the Ten Commandments themselves, but rather we're going to focus on um, an incident that occurred immediately after the Ten Commandments. The, uh, the Torah tells us as follows. Immediately after the Aseret Dibrot are presented, uh, as a matter of fact, um, literally the very next Pasuk, as we complete the Tenth of the Ten Commandments, the Torah tells us, V'chol ha'am ro'im et ha'kolot. All of the people apprehended, they understood, they, they either visually saw, or simply uh, they, they perceived the thunder, the atalapidim, and the lightning, the et kol shofar and the sound of the shofar, the et ha'har ashen, and the, the mountain that was smoking it, must have been an extraordinary uh, uh, physical event. Vayar, vayar ha'am vayanu. The people saw all of these events which were taking place, vayanu, and they literally trembled. Vayamdu merachok. They kept their they kept their distance. Vayomru el Moshe. Now here comes their their plea to Moshe Rabbeinu, and we're going to hear their plea and his response. Vayomru el Moshe. Daberata imanu vinishma. Don't don't let God tell us anymore. You speak to us, and we will we will listen. We will do uh, whatever you tell us to do. daber imanu Elohim. Let God not speak directly to us. En namut. Lest we die. And the word lest. Probably only hear that word in a Chumash class. It means to say um, that to prevent our death. That's really what lest means. To prevent our death, if God speaks to us directly, we are physically um, in, in fear of our lives. Yomer Moshe and Moshe said, El Ha'am, Al Tirau. Don't fear. Don't fear. For the purpose of testing you, that's what it appears, the nasot seems to be to test, God has come, and so that the, the fear of him, we're going to use the term now, the fear of him shall be on your face, a very strange semantic usage. So that you don't sin. The people's request, I think we can probably reasonably understand. Moshe Rabbeinu's answer at first blush is very hard to understand. First of all, we have two real questions here. First question is Moshe says to the people, don't be afraid. Why? Because the purpose God has here is to test you. Now, when you think about this, that I can't think of any any more anxiety-provoking uh, uh, event than a test. Just picture it. You, you studied four years in college, one of your your uh, whatever it may be that that you whatever professional degree you want. It could be a CPA, it could be uh, some sort of licensing that's going to keep you uh, for the next 40, 50 years, uh, at least the next 40 years. Uh, it, it, it will allow you to be able to, to, to derive an income. And the person who just before he gives a test, he says, don't worry about it. It's just a test. That's incomprehensible. Just a test. And it seems to be what, how much more so, that seems to be what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying. Don't be afraid. Because I'll tell you why. God just wants to test you. The worst thing is that could happen is that God tests you. That's uh, at least from a human perspective. That's question number one. Question number two is, he just said, Al-Tira'u. 
In Pasuk, in other words, uh, just so you have the place, in Perakaf, uh, Pasuk Yud Zion, Moshe Rabbeinu says, Al tirahu, don't be afraid, because God is just coming to test you, and it is for the purpose of having fear of him, literally on your face, whatever that means. We'll explore that as well. So that you don't sin. So we have two, what we would call a koshi. Koshi or kasha is when I get I don't expect. That's what a koshi is. There are informational questions. How old was Avraham when he, when he came to Eretz Yisrael? How, how old was Moshe Rabbeinu when he died? Uh, how many children did Leah have? Those are informational questions. A koshi, from the word kashe, a difficulty arises when I either get something that I didn't expect or I don't get something in the Pusik that I do expect doesn't come about. So when that happens, we have a koshi. So we have two kshayim here. One is, I, I don't expect God to say, uh, don't be afraid, God's just testing you. That does not seem to, uh, to agree with the, the, um, the, the circumstance itself. And the second one is, he immediately says, God, the whole purpose here is that uh, fear of God shall be with you or on your face. Those are the two questions. Now, uh, the first thing, that we that I'd like to talk with you about is uh, to mention the uh, the Oznayim la Torah. The, there's a sefer called Oznayim la Torah. It doesn't really mean ears of the Torah. The, in the, in the, in the Gemara, the Gemara tells us that all of the Torah Shabal Peh, all of the oral law, are like the ears on a jar. In other words, if you don't have a handle on the jar, the Torah. I mean, the Gemara calls them ears because they look they're shaped look like ears. But it means the handles that jut out, like on a like on a a, 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 tea, a cup a teacup, something of that nature. So the Mora tells us that that's why we have a Torah Shabal Pet, because it allows us to be able to get a handle on the Torah. Otherwise, many things are not understood. So uh, Rav Zalman Sarovskin, the Lutzkarov, a very very great Talmud Chacham of Europe of the last century. Um, said uh, two things. He said, number one, the people, why did the Torah, the people are asking, why does God come to us in these remarkable uh, uh, phenomena of nature? The, the smoke, the, the lightning, the thunder, all, the trembling of the mountain itself, all of that, what was the necessity? So he says, uh, the Lutzkarov, the Suretskin says, uh, uh, also that the me, I'm, with this, he's going to explain what does it mean, Levavur Nasotetchem. We understood it is to test you, to test you. Um, and the test makes people more nervous, not less. So he says, Ki Torah, the people who ultimately will keep the Torah, they will have to go through, he says, fire and water in order to maintain it. The Lutzkarov says the reason that we, we underwent all of those phenomena, which seem to be, you know, beyond the natural phenomena, the fire and the, and, and the, uh, the thunder and all of the, uh, all of the uh, events of that moment, he says, because it's to indicate to the Jews that ultimately they would have to go through fire and water and death and deprivation and all of the difficulties of what it means to be a part of the Jewish nation. And so here, the nasotetchem, says the Lutzkarov, doesn't mean to test you. It means to toughen you. That we know that we want to put, uh, you know, uh, if, if we want to uh, have some sort of element um, to withstand uh, extreme punishment or diff or difficulty, let's say whether it's metal or whether it's some other substance, so we need to toughen it sometime. And so he says, the reason that they went through all of this is not to test you, but to toughen you, to make you ready to be able to go through that as a nation. So we can see at the very inception of the Jewish people as a nation, 
as a nation. Two things happened. First, we had to go through Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim itself and the, and the servitude, the shiabud that they went through in itself set, set the tone for Jewish history. Now that they're going to receive the Torah, the Torah for which so many sacrifices would have to be made, so God uh, made a, a, an indelible impression upon the Jewish people at the moment of the giving of the Torah. That's what uh, the Lutzker of um, Rabbi um, Sarutskin said. Now, the Torah talks about not so much about the uh, the test itself, so to speak, the usage of the word test, but the uh, the Gemara and Adoram deals with the question of the second question that we ask. If Moshe just got done telling them, "Don't be afraid," then he says, "The reason you're going through this is so the fear of God will be with you." What does that mean? So the Gemara and Adoram makes a, a, a quite a, a famous statement, and it says. So that fear of him will be, quote, on your face. Zobusha. The Gemara says, implanted now, embedded within the Jewish collective personality is Busha. That we should have a sense of humility and even a sense of embarrassment to be to be, have the ability to become embarrassed. Now, first of all, for most of us, uh, I, almost all of us, I would imagine, the last thing I want is to be embarrassed. So preparing for you this evening, you can bet that, th that there was some nervousness that I had. Any shear that I give, the people who take their time and are very serious about learning, so I get nervous a bit. Why would I get nervous? The answer is because I have to have some form of busha. I do not want to be embarrassed by misstatements or or uh, elements that that, uh, that that may be incorrect. And so, therefore, the Torah, uh, the, the the Gemara in the Dorm says, what does it mean that they, they should be al penechem that yirat alokim, the fear of God, should be on your face? He says that's the face of a person who knows and understands the concept of uh, humility and embarrassment. I, I think one of the great tragedies of our age is in the world, there is no embarrassment. In the world, nothing is shameful. No one is shamed by anything. Right? That, that if, if you listen on the radio, it doesn't matter whether it's, usually it's certain forms of entertainment in general, uh, the foul language. There's no shame in foul language. No shame uh, in, in, in simple vulgarity in the world anymore. There's no shame even when we talk in sports, what used to be something that you would have your child um, watch sports or, or at least listen to sports. It's not there anymore. There is no shame. People say what they want, whatever comes to mind. And that, the Gemara says, when we get to a situation, a person, who knows no shame, a person who knows no sense of embarrassment. He says, alacha, the Gemara says, you should know that his ancestors probably did not stand at sight. Now, that's not something we can uh, easily, that we can uh, easily uh, uh, confirm, but so, so strong the Gemara feels that the the i the idea of being able to have some sense of shame whether it's about again the, the speech or whether it's about sexual activity or any of the things that are a part unfortunately a part of our daily life we hear it um if if there is no shame then uh then there's also no yiratelukim there's no fear of god so therefore um the gemara tells us what does it mean vavortiya Yirat Elohim al that the that your very face shall indicate that you have a reverence for God. Yirat Elohim. Now let's talk a little bit about the word Yira, Yare. Yare means to fear in its uh, in its simple sense. What is fear? Fear is an emotion that is evoked 
when a human being, or even an animal, but a human being feels threatened, feels that his, uh, his or her um, physical being uh, is in jeopardy. And so there is a certain fear that we have. It also happens uh, not physically as well. If uh, I wake up and I find out there's a test today, and I didn't know that there was a test, um, or I, I, I forgot an appointment, which was very important, so there, and that I, there could be a consequence for, so one can feel a sense of fear. That's the, and that's a visceral, a visceral human reaction to something that could happen. Human beings have it. Animals, to some extent, do have it. Otherwise, they don't run. Animals are very, very attuned to their, the predators that may be near them, um, whether it's, let's say, on the Serengeti Plains or, or any, any place where large, uh, large groups of animals gather. All of a sudden, they stop. They listen, and then they can sometimes just uh, go in, into, a, uh, uh, into a, uh, a, a run, all of them running away from the perceived danger. So that's one form of Yira. But the Malbim, the great, great Torah scholar of the, of the 19th century, who lived in Eastern Europe, he, like many Gedolim of the 19th century, spent a great deal of time on the meaning of words, they were scholars in um, scholars in Hebrew. Um, so you'll say, well, wait, of course, all the rabbis are. No, not all the rabbis are scholars in Hebrew. They're not necessarily. They may be scholars in halacha. Uh, many of them are scholars in Hebrew, but um, they, they they use the Hebrew language for what they need, and uh, which of course is immense, immense. Uh, the Gemara spends time on it as well. But uh, the origin of language, et cetera, the, sometimes the very fine details are not necessarily something that they, they indulge in. But the Maldim and, and, and others um, spent a great deal of time understanding this, uh, the, what words mean. He took note, he said, take note that the word Yare, Yud, Resh, Aleph, and the word Ra'o, Resh Aleph He share two letters. Ra'o Resh Aleph He means to see. And uh, Yare Yod Resh Aleph means to fear. But those two letters imply an awareness that a person has. And so it's interesting, the Malbim hints to us that. Yirat Hashem does not, necessarily, does not necessarily mean that there must be a visceral fear of impending doom. It is rather an awareness of, of what our responsibilities are to Hashem, out of what our responsibilities are to other people. I want to give you an example. Uh, this happened to me. I, you know, I, I was... Um, um, I, I've had the, the great honor of being in administrative positions and the number of schools. So uh, please, the issue here is not which school, but I, I want to tell you a story of a young boy who was 15 years old, and, um, and boys who are 15 years old uh, are not always perfectly disciplined. The boy was brought in, maybe he's 14 years old. The teacher brought the, the boy into to my office, and he said, do you know what this person did? He took a huge book, I think it was a biology book, and in the middle of the class, he threw it across the room. Okay. So he said, you, you have to handle him. I don't want to deal with him. So I, I understood that too. He was really, first of all, you, you can get killed by that. A biology book, all right, if you throw, let's say, a, a grammar book, which is light, but a biology book. So I said to him, first of all, I said, is it true? Did you throw the book? He said, yes. I mean, first of all, uh, there, there didn't appear to be any busha that he had. He didn't seem to have any, any, uh, any, any uh, uh, sense of shame. I said, let me ask you a question. You know how I feel about throwing books in the room? Well, would you have thrown it if I was there? So he said, no, like that. No, of course not. And then with a beautiful pregnant pause, he smiled and said, but you weren't there, okay? So then I said to him, but he was. Certainly HaKadosh Baruch Hu was there. You can bet in the morning when the boy put on tefillin, 
He put his tefillin on properly. He probably had gasos or echad. When he ate, you can bet that, that, he, that he only had Chal of Israel, and you can bet that he was very careful with all of those mitzvot that he had, but yet his sense of awareness was not fully developed. If I wasn't there, he wouldn't have thrown the book, but God was there. I guarantee you by now he's married. Thank God he probably has four or five children at least, and he's a wonderful father and a wonderful husband, but awareness he did not have at age 14, or maybe even 15. That's something, sometimes I, I, I've come to the conclusion that uh, full re religiosity, I'm not talking about observance. Observance, we get kids to do very early, and they're very good about it. But full religiosity, the feeling of yira, meaning to say that God is in the room, that takes years to develop. And unfortunately, for many people, it never fully develops. So therefore, Moshe Rabbeinu says to them that you should know that the yira, this sense of awareness, not just the fear, but the sense of awareness you must have, it should be, on, it should be literally, it should be visible on your face. And of course, if you look at the Chavetz Chaim, if you look at Reb Chaim Ozergajinsky, if you look at any of the great people of our, uh, great great people of our, of, of, of our nation. You see it on their face. You can see the humility. You can see a sense of shame and embarrassment if they felt that they didn't do something right. A, just come to mind that right now. Re, they tell the story of Rabbi Yosha Ber Salavetia, who was, <laughs> I was never in his class, but they say he was a terror in class <laughs> because he demanded excellence. He demanded preparation, demanded excellence, and uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik um, was, uh, he was giving a, apparently a, a very involved Devar Torah. Th this is not apocryphal. Uh, it's been verified, the story has been verified, so that it's pretty much a, a part of the log of, what, of how he conducted his life. And a boy asked the question on this um, piece of Torah that he was saying, that was rather involved. And, and Rabbi Yosheber, said to him, what are you saying? Can, don't you understand? Can't you see this? Weren't you listening? Uh, you know, he, he, the boy really was put down. So they go to lunch after shear, and across the street from, from the shear the shear room um, is, is a pizza place at YU. It's a pizza place there. And everybody's eating pizza. And guess who walks in? None other than the Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi Yosheb Ber Salavich. I would imagine that you, that's as close as you're going to get to deer in the headlights. Um, uh, they all look up and they see him there. He walks over to his student and he says to him, you were right. I was wrong. I, what I was telling you was not proper Torah. I apologize. He turned around. He certainly didn't have to do that in front of 20, 30 boys, whatever, no matter how many people were there. But he knew that's different from having no shame. That means to overcome the shame, to do what is right, to seek what is emet. That is the Torah of Sinai. And his Torah was the Torah of Sinai, as, as was Reb Chaim Moser's, as was the Chavetz Chaim. So that is embedded within us, that idea. Now, I wanted to share with you a, another thought. And that is, as I mentioned to you, uh, you know, actually, there, there, there are two, I haven't mentioned it yet, but I'm going to mention it now. There are two types of yira, yare. I did say that, of course, yare is the visceral fear that one has of impending uh, uh, pain or injury or, God forbid, death. The second kind is, uh, as, as the Malbim says, the second kind is that of, uh, of awareness. Because awareness is a survival technique, too, by the way. If you go somewhere that's dangerous, you're always aware of what's around you. If you're not aware, you're in trouble. So this awareness um, is a second meaning. Now, uh, another master of words, uh, the Baal Ketava HaKabbalah, that uh, is, um, that is Rabbi Yaakov Mecklenburg, who uh, was a contemporary of the, of, 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 um, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, a younger contemporary. Uh, these are very, very great people, exceptionally great people. So he wrote a parish on Torah, 
And in it, he, he tells us, but I think, I think it's also found in the words of the Rambam as well, there are two types of yira, aside from what we said earlier. One type of yira is, he says, on an elementary level, which is called yirat ha'onesh. Human beings need to fear because of accountability. When I do things wrong, if I mislead people, whether it's intentional or it's unintentional, if I do things that are wrong, I need to have an elementary fear that I'm accountable to something above me, to HaKadosh Baruch. That's the great, that is the great gift of all religion to the world, that man is not an autonomous being. She, he, is accountable to something greater, namely the creator of the universe. That, of course, helps us to stay on the straight and narrow. So that's the first, but it's a low level. He says, but there's a second type of year. The second type of yira is yirat haromamut. It is the fear, or it can actually be more the awareness of the grandeur of God. Let me give you an example, I think, of the difference between the two. If you've ever been to Niagara Falls, and you went on the Maid of the Mist, it starts about a mile away from the falls, you get on this boat and it chugs its way because it's going against, against the, uh, the, the, the the water, the water is, is coming, let's say, east, and you got to go west. And, and the closer you get to the falls, the more thunderous the falls are, the more you get so- soaking wet, and you realize you are nothing. And you realize that if, if that wa- even, even a fraction of that water would hit you, it would end your life in, in, in a second. That's Yerata Onish. That's knowing how fragile life is. But there's a second type of, of uh, experience at Niagara Falls. It's standing next to the falls. It's watching the beauty of the water rushing over, thousands of tons of water rushing over, the beauty of, 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 the, of the rainbow that may, may appear through all of that. And you, and you realize, how magnificent are your creations, Hashem. That is the difference that is that's yirata romamut of to be a part of something so great as we are we are a part of something great certainly the torah a hundred times more than niagara falls so the difference is between being under the falls or next to the falls. when you're under the falls that's yirata onish the fear the recognition of how fragile our lives are that could end at any moment and and uh, Yirata Romamut is the, not a fear, it is an awareness that we're part of something magnificent and great. Now, I want to conclude with uh, a statement by, uh, by the Nitziv, Rav Naftali, uh, uh, the Nitziv, Naftali Tzvi, uh, Berlin, uh, who was the Russian Shiva of the uh, uh, of, of the Velozhner Yeshiva. He wrote as follows. He says, it, I'm going to read the Pusik again quickly. Moshe said to the people, Altiro, don't be afraid. Now, now you can see, Moshe said, don't be afraid. Don't just have a visceral fear of the world. Religious people should not walk around in fear because then they can't accomplish. We all know that fear, while it may be a good uh, a good technique to say ourselves, but it doesn't, it's not real good necessarily for, for accomplishing. So he says, don't do that. It is to make you stronger, to make you greater, not to test you. Then he says, that our, uh, our sense of busha, our sense of shame should be constantly with us. Our sense of who I am. Uh, arrogance has no place in the life of a Jew. No place. So that, now, normally we say it means so that when you have this sense of shame, you won't, you won't fear. Uh, you won't sin. And it seems says to us, Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin says to us, you know, of course that's one way to look at it, but he's troubled by the word levilti. Levilti if it means not to sin, it means that would be livli, not to. But livilti, he says, that's not, 
that's not what it means here. He says it means that, that the sense of humility, the sense of, a, and that humility comes because God is there and I sense it every minute, that humility that I have should be so ingrained in me that I have it even when I'm not worried about doing wrong. That everything that I do, whether it's going to the car, it's filling gas, or whether, whether it's going to the store, whatever it is, that sense of yira, not fear, that, that sense of awareness is so ingrained within me as a, as a Jew and as, an, as a believer that it's levilti yechatel, even when you didn't do something wrong, it's there. Most of us, I think, fear out of a sense of guilt. When we do something wrong, we say, uh-oh, I'm paying for that one. All right? Okay, that, that's not terrible. That's part of the religious person. Accountability, because we said again, that's what religion gave to the world, that human beings need to have a sense of accountability. More than that, says the Nitzir. Far greater than this, um, shall we say, contractual agreement that we have with God. I'll do good and you'll reward me. And if I don't do good, not, I don't mean well, but if I don't do that which is good, so then I will, then I will pay the price. That's, that's a low level of it. Um, the great psychologist, uh, uh, Lawrence Kohlberg uh, of, of Harvard, said that people who are, when it comes to moral decision making, he said, there are six stages. We grow in stages. Uh, not all of us get to all the six stages. Most of us don't. We get to four. But he says two things. The lowest stage is fear of retribution that people act because they say, well, if I don't do this, I could either have something, I'll be deprived of something, or I will, or I will, I will be punished in some way. And so therefore they act, irrespective of whether the act is ethical or not. And he said, ultimately, there are those few people, Moshe Rabbeinu, um, who act purely out of a sense of justice and goodness, purely out of a sense of awareness, Yirat Hashem. So that should be as we as we approach this Shabbos, which is Shabbos Mavorchim. Maybe the lesson we can take with us is awareness to try in our daily life to be more aware and less fearful, because when you're more aware, you really need less fear. All right, have a wonderful Shabbos. Thank you for joining. Next week, in the Yitzchak Shem, uh, we'll, we'll we hope to do it again on uh, on Wednesday. Call to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Great, great.